Hey, what's up? Mr. Bill here, doing my weekly date plug. Um, December 18th, I'm playing Denver, 19th Santa Fe, 20th San Francisco again, uh, 21st in Columbus, and then January 11th, Philly, 17th Montreal, 18th Providence, and 24th Detroit. Go to mrbillstunes.com forward slash tour or pretty much any of my social media and you can find information for any of those. Uh, go to beleagualbeats.com. I just released a new EP on there. Uh, Beleagual Sounds is a new sample pack company that I just launched. You can go to my uh, any of my social media and find information for that stuff there if you want me to ask guests questions in the podcast go to the discord community you can find the link to that in the show notes and then i can sort of take your questions from discord and ask them to the guests when they're here and also remember to rate comment and subscribe on the apple podcast app because it really helps us out thanks enjoy the podcast hey you're listening to the mr bill podcast hey you're listening to the mr bill podcast hey you are listening to the mr bill podcast hey you're 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 listening to the mr bill podcast Check, check, one. Yep. Cool, man. Welcome to the Mr. Bill podcast. Thanks for having me. Of course, yeah. Yeah, I come back. Fuck, I'm in episode 15. It's mission. Putting in, putting in the work. Yep. Putting in the work of talking. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't seem like that much work. You're good at it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I've enjoyed I've I listened to a few of them. I think you're, I mean, I'm really glad you're doing this. Like, you're giving people a chance to really kind of sit down and yeah. And talk and yeah, there's no real like long format interview thing for electronic artists. I feel like there's a lot of that shit like in the comedy world with yeah. like you know obviously Joe Rogan, but then also like well there's like Duncan Trussell and then Burt Kreischer and Tom Segura and like all of those guys. And I feel like that makes total sense because comedians are like natural talkers. Like they're really that's what they do. Like their whole job is literally <laughs> talking. So it just makes and also I mean. I mean, it's probably similar to being a producer, right? It's like you write writing jokes and shit sometimes, and then what do you do for the rest of the time? Yeah. Might as well <laughs> sit around and talk, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and they all kind of shop each other around, right? They're like, yeah. everybody's got their podcast, and they do the rounds. Yeah, there's like a circuit, right? Yeah. And it's like if someone releases a book or some shit, they'll like go and do all that. Yeah. I've been thinking about doing one as well. How much, I mean, how much time are you spending on this? So I have a guy that edits it for me. Yeah. Um, so not as not not that much like i mean that was kind of my hesitation to always doing a podcast is right. that it could easily become just like so much of my time just doing shit loads of editing and yeah f just a ton of shit like especially on the even just the distribution side like you know i mean you know how it is you, you ran a label for a long oh, i guess we should we should probably like introduce <laughs> you right i'm so fucking bad at that <laughs> it's good it's cool um, warm right, so it up warm it up <laughs> yeah yeah so you you uh i mean you you explain it sure what do you, who are you so you my name is jesse breda <laughs> yeah, yeah. uh founder of of Gravitas Recordings. Nice. I'm also co-founder of Pivotal Agency mm -hmm. uh, with Cole Jones and your uh, manager, Anand Harsh, mm -hmm. has now joined with us as well. And uh, yeah, and I also have a web design company called Lionshare Digital where I build websites from anybody. We just finished the Glitch Mobs website. Oh, that's right. Um, we do websites for music festivals and then also corporate companies like Kuka Robotics or Keller Williams. So... Yeah, so uh, label owner slash curator runner slash yeah. web developer slash agent. Yeah, manager. and I manage, right now I'm managing Beats Antique, mm -hmm. Desert Dwellers, and Blue Tech. Nice. And I previously managed Closey and was her label uh, for a very long time. And now she has joined with Red Light as her management team. Still very close, all on good terms and nice. super happy for all the success she's having. So Yeah, was, she's crushing it. So that she like, just, yeah, every time I see a picture of her in front of a crowd, I'm like, what? And it's, it's like happening I'm really big. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's, just, she's definitely got the golden touch, man. <clears throat> yeah. Absolutely. People seem to really like what she's doing, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be honest. I don't get it. Um, but I don't get a lot of popular stuff. Yeah. Generally, almost anything that's popular. I'm like, I don't understand why this is so popular. Yeah. I mean, you're pretty esoteric. I think, I mean, when I listen to your music, I hear a lot of roots in like jazz and, you know, you have your, your time signatures and your beat structures and stuff. I mean, you're, you're a very intelligent human being. I think we oh, can, we you. all know that and we can all see <laughs> I that. I don't feel like I'm very intelligent. Well, I 
I mean, we all have different types of intelligence. I think right. when I watch, especially when I watch you make music, I'm just like, whoa, what's happening inside of your brain? It goes so fast. And it's just... it doesn't feel like a lot is happening when, <laughs> when I'm making music. Well, that's good. That's yeah. great. And I think that's what people, maybe people are trying to learn from you and your, your tutorials, how uh, unfettered and unblocked you are by the decision-making process. That's always been something right. that I think has been inspiring about you. Right. Um, yeah. So circling back uh, to before we went to the, who are you thing? Yeah. Um, with the podcast, you, I mean, you know, obviously what, what is in, involved with distribute, just dis, distributing anything. Like, yeah. Um, so with a podcast, I mean, it's no different really. It's like, you've got to go to the back end of a thing and like upload it and then like put all the tags in and shit. Yep. And I mean, that stuff takes a long time too. I mean, to, to, to distribute a podcast, I don't know, it's probably like 30 minutes of work or something like that. Plus all the editing, which is probably a few more hours of work. And then the recording of the thing, which is a few hours of work. So I was like, if I do one of these a week, that's like one day a week gone. Yeah. Basically. So I got a guy, luckily, um, he, uh, so this guy, Robert, Robert Fumo, I think he originally was working with Bass Gorilla yep. and he was like, man, you got to do a podcast and he was like, I'll edit it and I'll just dis distribute it for you and all nice. that stuff. So I was like, cool. Yeah. If you're willing to do that. Is I'll he in Australia? No, he lives in Amsterdam, but he's actually originally a Colorado native. Okay. Which is kind of cool. Very cool. So yeah, you, yeah, you've got a, t you got a team. I mean, that's, that's yep. the key is having somebody to do some of the, Yeah. I won't call it grunt work, but you know your time is better spent making music and yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. So. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we, I guess I left one thing out. I also created Gravitas Create, mm. definitely inspired by you, uh, Ill Gates and that whole music education. So we, we started Gravitas Recordings. We had some success with that as a label. And then we wanted to start Gravitas Create for a couple different reasons. We wanted obviously to do things like sample packs, tutorials, but quite honestly, there's a ton of people doing that and we're not really the top of that game. What I did learn is that so many of the fans of Gravitas and Gravitas artists also make music themselves. So we really wanted to provide a platform for the music production community to, let's say we release an EP with someone like Megan Hamilton. Well then, we'll maybe pick the standout song from that EP and offer up some stems or offer up some samples. And so we can engage the music production community on that level and offer them something for that. And, you know, you did a remix contest with us. That's actually a really cool story. So in, what was it? 2012. Was this Closey's first uh, thing on Gravitas? Yes. Too? Oh, this is fucking crazy. It's I a didn't... crazy story. So yeah. we did a, uh, one of the ways that we got started, you know, John Burcham um, was the label manager for Gravitas for a really long time. And we came up with this idea. We want to do a, a music compilation for Charity Water. And uh, that was inspired by Justin Beretta from the Glitch Mob. And so we and, put this. And the idea was like um, people give you a bunch of tracks and then all the money you would give to yep. like uh, companies that don't, uh, sorry, countries that don't have like potable water. Yeah. So Charity Water is a very well run, established charity. They are absolutely uh, transparent. One of the things that I love about them is as you donate the, the money, you start to get feedback and like real world pictures of what they're actually doing with your money. So once you hit $5,000 of donations, they'll send you a, a, an image, a picture from the field where they say, we built this clean water well in this city. And that has a real world impact of saying now these women and children in this city, now they don't have to travel two hours every single day to fetch clean water. They can actually go to school or they can work. And that has a really dramatic effect. So that was a really cool thing. We just said, hey, I want to get behind this. I want to I want to push this. So we reached out to people like you, Edit from the Glitch Mob, Grammatic, Craddy. This is 2012. It was kind of like the you know glitch hop scene was popping off. And your song, Chia, was absolutely like a standout from that compilation. And so we said, hey, why don't we do a remix compilation of that? Or sorry, a remix contest. And the first prize winner of that was Haywire. Right. And the second prize winner of that was Closey. Right. Who, yeah, they were both pretty unknown at that time too, right? <laughs> those were like, yeah, those were people's like absolutely, you know, come ups. Yeah, so. those guys were, um, yeah, both Closey and Haywire are nuts. Like they're such good producers. Yeah. So that was a lot of fun. I actually, you know, when we did Closey's Evasion Tour in 2018, I was testing some Facebook messaging marketing where you could sign up to be like on her Facebook messenger distribution list. So, and this is through, through a, uh, a software called tone Den. and I was testing that and I went to Facebook and I saw it messaged me from her page. 
And it was, and then I saw the very first message that I ever saw sent to her, which of course I assumed she was a, a guy. And I said, Hey dude, you won the <laughs> second place prize on the yeah. Mr. Bill contest. Nice. And that was the only time I'd ever messaged her page. And that was, that was a really kind of funny thing to see after many, many years of working with her. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That was a fun one. I still get asked about that track sometimes too. People are like, man, why didn't you play that track? I'm like, cause it's fucking 10 years old and it sounds like shit. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. It's got a great melody. So to, to kind of complete the thought is we created, we learned from those remix contests that people really love that getting their hands dirty. And we saw like from a marketing point of view, we saw that like, um, or social media engagement idea, like what's better than having a producer spend three or four days in the studio remixing your track like that's they're never going to forget that song mm -hmm. and a lot of those people are sort of the figureheads or the up-and-coming producers or djs in their local scenes and so that really helps you as a producer get sort of a foothold in some of those places those those are the people that are telling the promoters hey these are the people we should book these are the so right. so that's kind of where we came with gravitas create so my thought with the podcast would be potentially sort of the bridge between gravitas which is more of the record label and then gravitas create so hmm. yeah that makes sense so would you be the host of that podcast yeah i think so asking yeah. questions talking about people's process and how they have gone through getting started and you know those first few years of of trying to be a professional musician are really tough there's hardly any money and mm. you're just like you got to figure out how to make it work and there's totally. lots of different ways to do that yeah i think that would be an interesting podcast especially if you're hosting it because you have such like a deep understanding i think of the industry side of things versus say somebody like me who has like maybe a super basic understanding of the industry but like more of an understanding of like what it's like to be an artist in the yeah. industry working or and i would also want to talk about things like publishing and licensing which a lot of times Dude, we should talk about that absolutely actually. yeah i would love to so um one thing that a lot of people i guess don't understand is like the difference between uh like the different types of copyright sure should we talk about that first and then get into publishing and licensing um i would say the the number one tip i would say is google song trust uh pdf okay song trust is a Should publishing company they'll do a publishing admin deal for you this document is probably 20 pages long print it out and read it and then read it again and then read it again and that'll break down everything for you in a way that's easy to understand we'll talk about this and then people will leave and be like wait i'm still kind of confused right and sometimes i even get confused myself there are tons of different copyrights when we talk about music it's essentially intellectual property it's just a this imaginary thing. And, and especially when you're collaborating with different people, you have a vocalist, you have someone that wrote lyrics and the other person wrote the melody, all of those different components come together to create a song. It's a really, really complicated way of dividing rights and, and splits and things you, like that. Do you think that it's like, um, I've had this thought a few times where I'm like, this is, I feel like intentionally overly complicated just so people can't really understand. No, I wouldn't say that. I would say, unfortunately, because there's so many different ways that you can use a piece of music and there's so many different ways that, that people can come together to create music. If you think of like Nashville or Los Angeles where you have session players, you have people that are just songwriters, like literally writing the, the lyrics or literally just writing the melody or then you have an engineer or you have an executive producer, there can be 20, 30 different people on a like a Beyonce track and you need it's it's just complicated and then you might use it for film right and then and so the two types of copyright is like the intellectual property type which is sort of like the idea like the ethereal like yes. what the fucking essence of the thing is and then there's also like a master thing which is like the 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 wave file like yep. the actual thing that was created yep and so like say someone like the engineer or the producer might get more rights on like the wave file and like the selling of the wave file yep. and stuff like that but the person who like actually thought of what the essence of the idea was like beyonce or the the guitar player who like came up with the yep. the riff or the yep. the harmony or the chord progression or whatever yep. they will keep more of the intellectual property type of yeah copyright. so like bringing it back to like more relevant to like someone like yourself or somebody that's in electronic music let's say you're collaborating collaborating with someone or the the idea i like to use is say like uh, i work with a vocalist named christina soto she's on tracks with people like tritonal she did an ep with austin au5 right mm -hmm. that's a very good example where she wrote the lyrics 
and she sang on the song and Austin went and did all the production. Right. And that way they should speak split the publishing and the, and the writing 50, 50. It's a very, very equal split. So that's how you can think of that when you start to t talk about collaborations and the publishing and the, and, and then how that works. Right. Okay. And then, um, so to, to move on from like the different types of copyright to publishing and licensing, um, that's essentially like the way, how would you explain that? Basically you take a song, you put it in a library and then sort of like film companies, game companies, advertising companies sort of access you and they go like, all right, and you say, here's a library worth of shit. Just feel free to pick any of it to use in your stuff, but just give us money when you it, do or something. Yeah, I mean, there is library music, but I wouldn't encourage anybody to get in that game because it's really... Uh, that's the low end of the spectrum and the less interesting things are happening there. Uh, there are people that I know that have released on Gravitas that have made library music and they would tell me that's a pretty soul crushing job. So someone like yourself who released on mousetrap, you have a name. There are people that respect your musical productions. You would be more f fitted for something like a, a music agency. So just like you have an agent, then you have someone actually representing your musical library and they have the connections in the uh, music supervisor world, right? So music supervisors work for television, film, commercials, uh, whatever projects need music. And their job is to go and find the music that will work well for that project. And so that's a really cool job. So I would definitely encourage people to like look into what is a music supervisor. Those relationships are highly sought after and those people are extremely busy. And it's, it's sort of like being the talent buyer for a festival. You as a relatively unknown artist, if you hit them up, you're not going to get a good response because you don't understand all the inner workings of the, of that side of the business. And they're going to want to work with a professional agent that understands what an offer looks like, how to get it done, sign a contract, do, what does the deposit look like? So, so music supervisors prefer to work with music licensing agencies because those people have accumulated a library uh, of music that they are able to represent, right? So when you write a song, you have 100, by default, 100% of the publishing rights. You might go to, let's say there's a music company, a music agency out in California called Riptide Music. You might go to them and say, hey, I want you to represent my catalog. And if you get us, if you get me a, a license, then you would get a percentage of that, just like your agent would get a percentage if he landed you a gig. Does that make right. sense? Yep, yep. Cool. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> and I suppose the reason why you would sort of get the agent music dude is so you can send him all of your music. He can like siphon through what yes. you have the rights for and what you don't. And he yes. can like sort of get it all in the formats that it needs to be sent to the yes. supervisor. Yeah. And this, so there's software out there. There's a company called Disco. And so you can upload your music to Disco. You can, t in that world, you're talking about mute moods, other related artists, um, potential uses. And so the agency would put in the work and they would listen to that music and they would think through it through the lens of where could we see this music being used for? Would this be good for an action film? Would this be good for a trailer? Would this be good for uh, a soap commercial? Whatever, right? What the music what, supervisor, oh, sorry, not the, the agency. The agent. Yeah, and so what they would tag the, all of the music and then they have their catalog. And so if they get a request from someone like at HBO that's like, hey, we're looking for a song that's like, you know, upbeat with some horns and da 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 da, the agency would type that into their catalog and find maybe, you know, 10 songs. And then they would send that to the agency or the supervisor, the supervisor at the same time is probably doing that to 10 other people, 10 other music agencies trying to find the right fit. So he'll end up with a hundred songs. And yeah. One. And so then that gives them, it's a filter process. Like, you know, right. how are you going to communicate with a thousand independent artists? that just won't work well. And they don't understand yeah. the business well enough to, right. to do a good job. Of yeah. It. Yeah. So there's just like a bunch of filters. Kind of like a pyramid scheme. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but for good reason. Makes sense. Cool. So how do you um, suggest people get onto that if they're trying to get into putting their catalog into a library like that? Uh, I would I would do your homework and understand the vocabulary that we're talking about. Like, again, that song trust document is going to give you um, some of the initial vocabulary and under fundamental understandings 
of licensing and publishing. And then what I've done to train myself up is go to conferences in LA and New York, meet with these people, ask questions, listen, you know, I live in Austin, Texas. So during at South by, there's always a few, um, discussions about music licensing and publishing, go watch things on YouTube, just like anything else. There's going to be people that explain that. Uh, there's definitely Facebook groups about, about this stuff. So, I mean, there's a ton of information out there. You got to dig to actually develop those, those contacts, um, takes time. You know, one of the things that I did, um, early on is I started looking up music supervisors on Twitter Mm -hmm. and, uh, and LinkedIn. And so I would just type in music supervisor and I created a, just sort of a default Twitter account. And because when you follow someone on Twitter, it usually gives you three more, four more, five more suggestions of other people. And they're usually related to the industry that they work on. And so I started to build a little bit of a database of music supervisors and music agencies. And just to sort of understand the landscape and the companies that are out there. Mm -hmm. And that was just to get my feet wet and get a sort of understanding of what that world looked like. Yeah, right. Um, but now you're sort of hooked up, like all Gravitas is hooked up with a company like that? Yeah, well, not, no, not every song. I mean, it's it's not every song that we release is applicable for, for sync. You know, there's some songs that um, I would guess I would say most electronic music, as you know, is usually in minor key. It's a little more, you know, d- there's a little more down, dark, and what works on the dance floor doesn't always work for commercial or or uh licensing purposes so so not all of not all of gravitas's catalog is even in the even in the running for it do you would say mostly like the banger stuff you release um you don't even like sort of send to these places yeah okay yeah cool. makes sense what what people what i've been told what i hear more and more is like upbeat positive uplifting music has a you know if you're going to try and sell someone a car it's like you know, we're having a good time and we're all feeling good. Like that's what works in that world. Um, but that, but I don't want to discourage people. Like there's, we've definitely had good success with people like GoPro where, uh, action films, travel blogs, you know, the YouTube world, the micro licenses is definitely someplace I would start looking for YouTube channels and finding places where people have used, um, you know, like look in your circle of producers or people that you look up to and you'll see where their music gets played sometimes. And then you can kind of follow that trail, Mm -hmm. go down that internet rabbit hole and sort of see how that maybe happened. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, oftentimes like definitely for Closey, a lot of travel channels and, uh, world travel blogs would reach out and want to use her music because she has that world music sound. And so that was, that was kind of, um, you know, for beats antique, they have a very eclectic world sound they did a license for HBO and that was, you know, in that case, like that supervisor knew beats antique and they really wanted to use that specific song. So that happens a lot too. They'll have a, an idea in mind and then they'll want to kind of go after that. Yeah. I hear, I hear quite often like producers who make like dubstep or you know, just bangers or whatever. They're like, man, I'd really love to like score a movie or do a fil- a game or something like that. But I don't see it really making a ton of sense because it's like, uh, yeah, how do you just like go into a movie and just make a whole fucking dumpster? So my suggestion would be to do a study Mm -hmm. of of like take a piece of film that's really inspiring to you and then write for it. Just mute it. Yeah, 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 and do your thing for it. Mm -hmm. And that's basically, I mean, you. this is a whole different world. This is a whole different lane that you're driving in. If you're, you can be playing sold out shows all around the country. That doesn't mean you're going to get music licensing or someone's Mm going to want you to score their film. Yeah, well, I I got a film. I did the Nicolas Cage film, um, but the way that I got it was kind of weird. So the the director of the film, he just knew my music as well, but he also was like... um, he, he was trying to, I think, do the soundtrack himself, like John Carpenter styles. Yeah. And then I think he started looking at tutorials online and then found my tutorials and then also had heard of me before <laughs> and then was like, oh, fuck it. I'll just get this guy to do it, I guess. <laughs> 
That makes sense. Yeah. You probably saved him a lot of heartache. <laughs> yeah. That was fun. I would love to do more of that stuff. Um, Absolutely. It's like a com- you're, it is such a different vibe though, like going into a post production studio every day and just sitting down with editors. Yeah. So what music. was the process like? Tell me. I mean, um, so the process originally was um, there was no film at all when I first started on it, and he was just like, "Yeah, we just I don't know, just start making shit." And he gave me like some references, and he was like, uh, "Like gave me some film references, and then gave me some." Uh, just like a you know music references from basically john carpenter and a bunch of other people yeah and he was like yeah just make some stuff like that and i was like cool and i started to make some shit and he was like nah this doesn't really suit it and it's not like the vibe we're going for so it, it took me a while to like kind of figure out what they were going for that took about three months of just sending demos just being like is this right is this right um and then you know a couple of things were good but it took a while uh, for me to like understand what the vibe was that they were going for. And then they started sort of sending me cuts like of film. And it's kind of, um, it's kind of weird because usually there's, uh, usually what happens is they'll put what's called temp music under the edit. Right. So, uh, you know, usually the director doesn't edit. Usually there's like film editors and they'll edit and they'll just, you know, throw anything underneath it just so it has like something, you know, something. Right. Um, and you know, that can be like in, you know, the Hans Zimmer soundtrack or something. They'll just <clears throat> throw that under there. But the problem with that is when you send it to the composer, it's really hard to change it after something's been edited to something. It like feels really right. natural now for that piece of music to be there. Cause of the timing of the movement or whatever. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Or just like, I don't know, once you hear it one way, pulling it out, and changing it for anything else just seems weird. Right. So they were like, we don't want to do that. We don't yep. want to have any temp music. So you're just going to write everything from scratch. Yep. So I had nothing to work with basically other than these references. Um, so the process was basically me like stabbing in the dark for a while until I finally like figured out the vibe. And then I was like, oh, cool. He just likes plucky synth shit and granular noise. So I just like did a ton of that and then it was fine. So part of it was satisfying the director. But, 100%. Yeah. And like, then it's all you, about the director's calls. Oh, got it. But yeah. did you feel like you, aside from his opinion, do you feel like you satisfied your own self for the film and the creative yeah, work? I think so. Yeah. I, cool. I was pretty happy with the way it turned out in the end. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely a big thing. I want to go back just real quick for people listening. When you write your music, make sure to register it with, with your pro. your PRO, right? Yeah. That's like step number one. If your music is not registered with a PRO, you're not going to be able to license it to anybody because it's like it's the fundamental piece starting point. Secondly, you cannot have any unlicensed samples anything that would ca- that someone could come back on and say hey that was my voice or that was my guitar line and so what they call that is is it's it's cleared it's it's ready to go it's one mm-hmm. stop meaning there's nothing holding it back from being licensed it's not like oh well we've got this guitarist on this song and we're going to have to ask him if it's okay if we license this it means like everybody is in agreement this can be licensed very easily so that's a that's a big deal Mm -hmm. so yeah no one wants like any roadblocks in that industry definitely like what i learned from being in that in just that film industry for like six months was um yeah at any like yeah you definitely don't want to hit a roadblock at any point because everything is so hectic anyway it's like fuck we got to get this whole film done yep it's like you don't want anything stopping you from yeah i'll get i'll get requests where people say here it's called a brief Mm -hmm. and i'll say we're looking for a song that is like this and they'll usually have a couple example songs and there's a little bit of a description of what they're looking for and then i'll go into the catalog and i'll find maybe or sometimes other people that, that work for me will find five or ten songs that that makes some sense for that and then we send it up and that and the turnaround times on that is like i need this by the end of the day yeah yeah and it's like what like <laughs> really yeah. oh, yeah, <laughs> you're moving that fast and yeah the yeah. film industry is crazy like those those definitely stuff like that with with the thing i worked on too where they were like yeah we need uh this whole film done in a, a month <laughs> and i was like oh, okay okay i got it <laughs> All right. yeah yeah because I, I didn't really figure out like what they wanted until pretty much like you know, um, two months before it needed to be finished wow and then i was like oh shit i gotta score a whole film in like two months now dang <laughs> right on what else uh management we could talk about management love to um, yeah so one thing i get asked about a lot like um i get hit up by a lot of artists being like when did you go to find a manager when do you think you need one why do you need one like a lot of people don't understand the point sure um and i guess like agents as well we could kind of put these two things in yeah i would love that that's a great question i get that question a lot too um 
I would say for most people, if you are the owner of your project, you are the CEO of, of Mr. Bill, right? Mm -hmm. And you really should keep that idea in your mind forever. So you are the boss and you know, ultimately you should be in control. The next person down the chain, if you're going to have some sort of imaginary organ organization chart would be your manager. Ultimately, you're, you, that should be the person that you trust most in your life, in your project, maybe not in your life, but in the, in the project, your musical project, you're really handing over a lot of control and a lot of power. They should be able to make decisions for you pretty easily. Hey, I think we should do this tour. I think we should work with these people, you know, so on and so forth. Like this social is like, media posting as well. Stuff like that, I find right? that's a thing that a lot of people get like kind of precious about is like how stuff is like said on social media. They're like, yeah. oh no, I only want to like... You you know, I'm posting this today, so I'll post this other thing we did like tomorrow or the next day or something. I'll, yeah, it's like, dude, I, who cares? Just that's pretty small potatoes in my in my mind. It so, is, but like a lot of people get like caught up on just simple shit like that. But yeah. I mean, even getting somebody else to do that for you can open up like an hour a day. Totally, you're just not having to like think about a post. Yeah, so I mean, you as an artist, right? You're what you're what you're bringing to the world and what you can what you can do that nobody else can do is really the music and the creative work that you're doing right the, the the promotion of the project should often once you get to a certain point should be handed off to your management team and if your management team is at a certain point they likely have people that are working on the marketing and and those pieces and so and yeah it's important to have a voice and not come off like a robot but but the, that social media person or your manager should be able to know you well enough to be able to to work with you on that. And sometimes when we're doing stuff for people, we ask them, what do you, what do you want to say for this? If this is a monumental moment, a big thing, we'll talk about it. But if it's just like posting about, hey, I'm going to have this show here, like, yeah, yeah. there's only so many different ways you can say that. Yeah, you're like, hey, Rockville, I'm playing a show right. on this date. Right. <laughs> and, and so poster. next in line would be your agent. So I, what I would say, if, if you're just getting going in the industry, you've got some momentum, people are starting to want to book you in different cities, not your local scene. So you think you should get a manager before an agent? No, I think you should get an agent before a That's manager. That's what I think too, yeah. You should be your own manager. Yeah. You should learn all of those things and yeah understand how to do that stuff you may hate it you may not be very good at it but it's really critical at this day and age that you know how to do your social media you know how to release some music you know how to work with some labels you understand the fundamentals of working in the music industry to some point then when you start to have a manager when that happens you're still you're their boss you're, mm -hmm. you they work for you not the other way around yeah, I think that's another thing is like a lot of people who are hitting me up being like, oh, hey, like, you know, when do I need a manager or like, how can I do this and that? It's like, uh, you probably have to like put in a bit of work first yes. because it's like nobody wants to take on a project that they're going to be like, fuck, this is going to be a headache. Right. They want to take on something that they're like, I see potential in this already and it's already working and I could just like put it on steroids basically. Totally. Yeah. When, yeah, it's, it's well said. So, and the other part of it is the financial side, right? And, and that'll answer sort of when to get one. Most agents a standard deal is a 10% commission. So let's say you get paid a thousand dollars to play a show. The agent's going to take a hundred, a hundred bucks. Most management deals can range from 10 to 20%. That's sort of the industry standard. There's other ways of doing it. There's other things, but that's sort of the, the industry standard of, of where, where that lands. And that really determine like how much is the, is that person really doing for you Right in the early eight days of your project? Maybe they're not dealing with licensing. Maybe they're not dealing with publishing. Maybe they're not, you know, doing merchandising or all like managing every facet of your career. So it, it makes sense to maybe be at a lower percentage. So that's why I was saying, if you have a manager and an agent, you're maybe at 25% of your gross income is already leaving. So if you're trying to make a living as a professional musician, that's really tough to do that. So you, it, you gotta, you want to be so busy that you can't do those things. And that if you, like you said, you like, I could really use that extra hour or two or five in the studio, or I am touring so much that I've got, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I really need to rest Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, so I can be back on the road. There's no time to do all that business. And there's enough stuff happening where your manager is really needing to take that on. So there's another, there's another model where that person is 
and I, and I think this is kind of where, <clears throat> for example, like Closey and I did this, like she was on the come up, Gravitas was on the come up. And I think in my career, I was also on the come up and, and Cole as well. And we all kind of learned together. That's a more common way that, 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 that happens and sort of the very organic team starts to grow. And so I've seen a lot of people in our, in our scene have that, have that model and it, it works well. So. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's kind of what's happened with me and Anand a little bit over the last yeah. few years is like he was already doing well. Like, I mean, he was an agent already for a bunch of people and he was already managing a bunch of people. But I think like since we've started to work together, like stuff has tightened up a lot. Yeah. Definitely when we first started working together, it was like shows weren't getting announced at all sometimes. And like, you know, I was just rocking up to venues and like none of my fans knew about it. and shit. Dang. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, there's a learning curve for everybody, you know, and it, it's, it's a lot, there's a lot. And I mean, to really be a good manager is as much work and as much dedication as it is to be a really good artist. I mean, it, I would agree. Yeah. yeah. It's a, there's a lot of shit that you need to know to be a manager. Like you have to have a lot of information in your head specifically about like, yeah, obviously releasing music and like, you know, marketing for sure. Yeah. Marketing is a big one. That's something that I fuck up on a lot. I think it's like I still don't know how to do a fade, uh, fade a paid Facebook post myself. Oh wow! Like I get Anon to do all of those. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. I mean, and that and that's you. You know, any good partnership, you want someone that kind of counterpoints you. That's like, you know, I'm maybe not always. Uh, the most detail oriented and John, you know, when we worked with Gravitas, was, he was very detail oriented and that was a good partnership, you know, with pivotal Cole Jones. He's, he's, he's very process oriented. He's like, well, I want things to be like A, B, C, D, E, F. And when that happens, like I may, I'm able to sort of be a more big picture and strategy for the business. And he, he kind of makes the, the, like, the way it's actually going to work so we can do a good job doing those things. So is Cola more of a manager or an agent? I think he's an agent. He right? was, he was close his agent for a really long time okay. and he sort of cut his teeth in that world. We're moving more to wanting to be mostly a, a management company. We enjoy that more. Okay. I, I really enjoy being a manager. I do not like the, the agent side of the world. Have you it's, been an agent before? I have, I've done that, but I did not like it. It wasn't a lot of people right. don't. So like my first agent in America, uh, Alex Hutchinson, yes, he quit being an agent cause he was like, um, he was just like, I fucking hate it. It's, it's like the whole industry was just making him mad because yeah. I mean, it seems like a tough and stressful job, man. It like is. most agents I meet, I don't want to say they don't seem happy, but they always seem stressed. Yeah. It's like they're always on their phone emailing or on a phone call or, um, or whatever. And then like every time you talk to them, they're always just talking about offers and shit. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know. So it's a volume. That's where we go back to. It's, it's, it's a commission based job. Mm -hmm. So you need to be doing a certain amount of, of bookings, gross right. bookings in order to well, pay your rent. Exactly. That's the yourself. thing. It's yeah. Yeah. I was going to mention that before when you mentioned like the, the standard race for commission seems like the entire music industry on the um, back end, like on the admin end works on commission basis. Yeah. So yeah, it's kind of like as a manager or an agent, if you're getting 10% of an artist fee, you would need like, 20, 30 artists and you'd, they'd all need to be fairly busy for you to be making like a pretty good wage. Yeah, it's tough. That's why, I mean, there's a lot of consolidation in the industry right now with, with you know, I don't, Rogue Agency was a, a really, you know, a, a very well-regarded agency. They had grown their roster a lot and that they've just essentially closed their doors. A lot of the agents from Rogue have moved over to Madison House. So you need... Uh, th- it's tough. It's tough to be an artist. It's tough to be an agent. It's tough to be a manager. It's tough to run an agency. Like it's, it's, it's tough to run a club and it's tough to be a promoter. Like the, the margins and the, and, and the, the business is tough, you know? So yeah, you do as an agent or a manager, you need a certain amount of, of gross, you know, earnings in order to pay yourself enough to live. And so that can right. be, that can be very, um, you know, I can see agents pushing like, let's take this offer. Let's take this offer. And that may not actually be in the best interest of the artist. Right. Which so. is kind of where like a manager could step yes. in and be like, Hey, no, nah, that's yes. like, about, like, so <laughs> technically the manager should be managing the relationship of the agent and saying, no, yeah, yeah. we're going to pass on this offer, even though it's decent money, this is not a good look, or we don't think this festival is going to be, you know, X, Y, and Z. We have a history of not paying and things like that. So yeah, usually with me and Anand, we just have a conversation about most offers, unless something comes in, that's like a clear, 
yes. Yeah. Like if it's just an inordinately yep. large amount of money and it's yep. like you know, I haven't played there in a while and it's going to be big and all that shit and he'll just be like, yeah, well, let's do this. But otherwise, we almost have a conversation about every other thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's how it should be. I mean, either your agent or your manager should be bringing you all your offers. If it's, if, you know, one thing that we try to do is be efficient with our communication. So if, let's say there's a few offers stacking up, put them all in an email, really de detail it out. So it's really easy for you as the artist to go, Oh yes, no, yes. That way it was right. not like an hour long conversation to get a yes on one gig or something like that. Yep. That makes sense. Yep. Um, so yeah, Gravitas is still a thing that's happening. Yeah. Yeah, yeah man. Um, we, you know, we've kind of re re readjusted some things. Alicia Horn is now the label manager and she's done a great job. We have Holly, who's our social media and marketing person. And then we have Kaylin Gray, who's a relatively new hire. She's taken on the PR world and she's done an amazing job. I actually have never seen someone like come in and learn a piece of the business so quickly. And it's had a, it's had a great effect. I mean, we've been getting a lot more press and blog postings, which I mean, the, you know, I would say four or five years ago, like blogs were so much more important for people discovering your music and then Spotify has come along. And I think that, that more people rely on their discover weekly or the playlisting to discover new music. That game has definitely changed, but I think press is still really important and it, it validates to some extent, um, a release and music and, and it gives you something to talk about and, and, you know, working with a blog or a YouTube channel or a playlist to premiere your music can be a really cool way to get additional eyeballs that maybe, or, you know, ears that you don't have in your fan base. So, I mean, that's still the, still a great release strategy. So mm. yeah, Kevin's um, done great. Have you guys ever, or you guys and women and just you people? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm about to move to San Francisco. I'm practicing. Um, <laughs> um, have you people uh, ever had like a track on the label that's just gotten like insanely big? I find like a lot, of, I was talking to Dov the other day, he runs Moody uh -huh. and he was ta saying like he's had two tracks that just got like insanely big. I think one was an Antony track and the other one was maybe a Mimosa track. I mean, yeah, I mean, we have a few. I mean, you know, Bass Nectar remixed John's uh, song, One oh, Thing. Yeah. And did that come out on Gravitas? Yeah. The original came out on Gravitas. But and the remix didn't, right? The remix did not. But, but that, did the original still get like a lot of sort yeah, of plays? Yeah. Of, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, there's definitely several million. I mean, a couple songs from Closey have, you know, across the internet, definitely like tens of millions of plays. Um trying to think i mean what's big what's defined i mean i've never had a track crack a million so oh really yeah so i think that's huh. probably pretty big for me yeah yeah a million on spotify is good now that being said we can talk about this, this is something uh everybody sh right now sharing their spotify stats and there's some pretty contentious Dude, oh my god uh, there's a i've fucking telephone tel aviv like his twitter posts went crazy he wait was, he, he made a twitter post yeah he's made a few questionable twitter posts he went post. after what it. was the one he said today well i mean um, a couple ways of looking at it one and uh so you know we were with cloud Cord, and he's done extremely well he's in the ch chill hop sort of he used to be a different artist right yeah he was DVS. dvs yeah, yeah. and so gravitas has released a lot of his music and he's he kind of changed his sound a little bit and he's an extremely talented producer and he i think he saw an opportunity opportunity in the Spotify landscape where when people get home from their job and they want to cook dinner, they don't really want to put on dubstep. They don't want to put on heavy bass music. They want, for the most part, people want to listen to sort of some, some calming, relaxing music. And, and I think that was always inside of Derek cloud Curve for a really long time. So he started writing this music and he's done really well. And so his spot of Spotify streams this year were something like, I think it was like 20 something million, right? Wow. That's really good. And so it's like for, for Spotify, they're, they're giving us these tools as artists or managers, whatever, to share this stats. Um, another way to look at it is they're paying out 0 0.004 cents, maybe some depends on the deal like they have stream with the, per stream. So here's, um, actually before you go on, this is something that Ben from Ganja White and I brought up to me, um, 
so I already have a theory on this. My theory is like um, Spotify has a certain type of listener to it, which I would call a hyper casual listener, which means like they will listen to it while they're making their dinner, but it will just be in the form of a playlist. So yep. they'll fucking rip through a playlist, yep. hear 10 tracks that they thought were pretty sick, but won't know who wrote any of them. Yep. So you don't really build fans off of it. They but don't the thing translate is, is like, into fans and they definitely don't translate into ticket sales. That's the thing. And you really want them to because like what you make off a stream is like you said, 0.004 cents, but what you make off a ticket sale can be like 20 bucks yeah so or a like, merch or, or a piece of vinyl or, yeah, or a buying shirt. your album or something like that yeah yeah so anyway go on yeah. well so i think you know it's it's two things is like in a way spotify has sort of hacked it where they're getting the artists to really promote the shit out of spotify oh totally because they're like putting these stats out and people yeah. want to fucking piss and shit and like apple is just like totally losing the game in terms of 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 where people might stream music i mean it's that being said youtube is still the, the it's the second largest search engine in the world and there's more people streaming music there than anywhere else On and YouTube? they pay way less than youtube yeah internationally across the entire world oh okay yeah makes sense yeah because yeah, spotify is still not available in some countries is no, it? no they just struck a deal with india and i think in india it's a, do a dollar a, a one u.s dollar a month to have a spotify subscription so how can like this is still a very we're still in the wild wild west of streaming things mm -hmm. were shaking out i mean spotify is could you use lead. a vpn pretend you lived in india and get a cheap spotify account? maybe <laughs> you there could you try Life hacks, bro. <laughs> try and save yourself I mean, they'll, they'll probably identify i mean i have a family account and i have someone that lives in italy that uses one of those and i have people you know that i've given accounts to yeah, <laughs> that's right. a hack if you were like go in with your buddies and be like you want to pay 14 dollars a month or 15 dollars a month and you get five accounts true i reckon the vpn pretender in india is the real <laughs> shit there <laughs> yeah <laughs> So, so I think that so that's wait, pretty interesting. Yeah, what a telephone. He basically television? said, like, don't post your stupid stats. Like, okay. don't. And he was totally against it and saying, like, it's just like, it's just gross and sort of um, audacious and braggadocious. And I don't know that I necessarily agree. Cloudcore chimed in and said, basically, like, man, I'm really proud of this. Like, this is great. And and I think it's cool when you see, like, okay. My, this person's music played in 72 different countries, which I think is the, all the countries. Pretty good stat, yeah. yeah. It's very cool. Like, and so Spotify came in and they innovative, they innovated. They, they did a better job at recommending related music. They, they mm -hmm. went further down the music genome and said, this person released on this label or this person is in this circle of, of, and I, you know, I find that a recommendation engine better than anybody else. Yeah. So, so. this is something that bleep bloop told me once he was like, he, he, he was always like, man, I think SoundCloud is just, a shitty way to listen to music like i don't think it should be a social media feed yeah it should be like yeah a bunch of recommended shit that sounds like the thing you're listening to yeah which makes total sense and yes yeah, spotify kind of nails that yeah soundcloud has absolutely dropped the ball they forgot yeah. who their customers were then yeah, they yeah. try to compete with the big apple and spotify they're never gonna be win that game they're mm -hmm. never gonna have the marketing budgets to do that so so dumb no nah, soundcloud's like a, the small underground like you put your whips there yeah and like you send them to your friends and you write like you know two minute beats every day and just whack them up like oshi did for a while yeah. and like just that, that's the and then you know you can kind of grow out of a soundcloud audience and convert that to shows eventually yeah, and i'm just like if i'm paying a hundred dollars a year for a pro account and you're not servicing me and not giving me more tools and innovating, like they just kind of have stopped. Like when was the last time there was anything cool or innovative on the SoundCloud platform? It's just kind of gone backwards. I, I reckon the repost button kind of fucked it. That really, to be it really did. And yeah. I think ever since the repost button is when it started declining. Yeah. Cause your feed just became, it was just everything. It was garbage. A mess. Yeah, exactly. As soon as like the repost thing came into play, I think I was on like, cause I was a heavy SoundCloud user back yeah. in the day. I was like when it first started or maybe not when it first started, but basically from like 2010, I was like on it every day yep. and checking the feed and shit. And as soon as they put the repost button in, I used it for like maybe another month or two after that. And it was like, fuck this. Yeah. And then just, it's like, you still want to be there, but it's not where the action is. And I think at the same time, and this is something I'm really passionate about. I'm really excited. And we are working on this as a label is one. I think if Spotify ever added a tip jar, just give me, you know, Bandcamp's amazing, right? But their UI is garbage. It's such a dated uh, look, in my opinion. 
I don't like that it doesn't have a volume control. Yeah. That's my main issue with we'll it. We'll say like this, the way that they've designed that page, the way it's laid out is very dated. It's yeah. not... It's, I also don't like that it doesn't have continuous playback. Like, yeah. that's one thing I loved about SoundCloud is you could click through the yep. website and music would keep playing. Yep. Yeah, no volume control and continuous playback are like the two main things I don't like about Bandcamp. Yeah, and there's no I, and but and then on Spotify there's no community. There's no that's true, there's yeah. no you can't send a message to your favorite artist and say I love you. Yeah. There's no feed, there's no there's nothing. And so it's just it's a very passive experience. Mm. What I think people really want where MySpace Sometimes YouTube and a little bit of, and SoundCloud as well for a while when sound, when comments were cool, people wanted to be part of the conversation and have a discussion about the music and mm -hmm. even send their send their favorite artists a message. Right now, there's nothing like that really happening that I'm seeing, and I think there's a huge opportunity for. Well, you're a web artists. developer. I am. I'm working on it, man. <laughs> I'm excited. I mean, it's it's going to cost me an arm and a leg to develop this, but I'm really excited about it. And just to, to develop the idea, we're going to pair. In the future, every release that we do will be paired with a charity of the choosing for the artist. And so when you go to the landing page on gravitasrecordings.com, you'll be able to experience the music how the artist wants to. Maybe there's a music video, maybe there's not. Maybe there's a merch bundle, maybe there's not. If nothing else, it'll say, do you want to donate and download to the artist? Just like Bandcamp, but with a modern web interface where it's really letting the artwork and the music shine mm -hmm. and really, really letting that you know, creative creativity happen on the page, be able to donate to the artists. And then after that, once you click whatever you want to do there, you'll be able to also donate to the charity. So it's two different revenue have you, streams. Um, have you talked to the clip guys? They're I have it. They're also done in Austin. I mean, I have, I have in the past, but not about this project. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like they almost got there. Like they, they were doing like something that was cool, but yeah. they, there was a few things that they left out that didn't make a lot of sense. I don't think they did the continuous playback thing either. And there was like, I think no way to like playlist things. And like, yeah. I don't know, there was some shit that they didn't do. That continuous they... playback on web is actually pretty hard because you, I've heard, you have yeah. to basically do everything through JavaScript. You have to go fetch that new page and load it into the Dude, HTML DOM. Speaking of uh, JavaScript, <laughs> Um, Jan's boss invented JavaScript and she said I might be able to get him on this podcast. Whoa. She actually said he'd probably be Yeah, that. shout out to Jan and shout yeah. out to the Brave browser Dude, and, and it's Brave kind of a cool sick. time right now for web <clears throat> and privacy and security and I mean... Again, I feel like that's kind of the wild, wild west. Like, I don't think we all realize how much information we're giving away. That's intense. I didn't really notice until like I saw Jan talk about it a ton. And also like I went to, I've just by proxy of hanging out with her a bunch. Yeah. I've like seen her do a brave talk a few times now and just also hanging out with her a lot and hearing her talk. What is about. her job title again? Uh, she's the CSO at Brave. I mean, that's, that's pretty badass. Man. Yeah, it's pretty nuts. Yeah. <laughs> to be like the full security officer of like a security browser. Yeah. So Alex Gonzalez, Spoken Bird, connected us with mm -hmm. her and she was like, yeah, we're, I'm a big fan of, of Gravitas and she did a mix and we're going to put that out. And then next thing I know, you're like, tell, you know, kind of <laughs> say, yeah, we're, we're hanging out. And, and then she went on your tour to Australia. So yeah, that was cool. Getting yeah. Some dates. That's awesome. Yeah. She's a good DJ. Like she I was is, like yeah. legit impressed. I was like, all right. Yeah. She, so. she does a good job. Yeah. Um, Australia is fucking weird, man. <laughs> I got, <laughs> uh, every time I go back there, I hate it a little bit more. Yeah. I think everyone's like, man, was it sick to like go see your family? And like, I was like, nope, no, it was not that fun. Actually. Yeah. Is it just cause it's small or just, it's a weird it's scene or what? Small. It's a weird vibe, a weird scene. Uh, a lot of the people are nice, but there's a lot of like casual racism there still. And uh, I didn't really notice it when I lived there, but like having lived in a more progressive place and now going back there, I'm like, oh man, this is bad. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't even want to repeat. Like, a lot yeah, of stuff right. That I heard. Wow. Is it, what, where is the racism? Is it, what, what? Well, who's it towards or what's the who's uh, the scapegoat in the country <laughs> uh just and like literally it doesn't matter like, okay anything there's, there's also a lot of like i think uh toxic masculinity there and stuff like that got it just a lot of that kind of shit like because it is kind of i mean it is a rough climate right it is a rough it is very kind of like rural in some cases oh yeah for sure and also it started with convicts so yeah. it's like literally ev almost everybody there yeah has this like criminal bloodline yeah which, which <laughs> makes me question like uh 
when someone is a criminal, is it because of like their upbringing or is it a genetic thing? It's probably a bit of both, right? A bit of both, I'm yeah. sure, yeah. So it's like everyone has this like shitty gene in them probably. No, I mean, <laughs> maybe maybe there's a little bit of that, but I mean, yeah, I would say mo- they. I would say if most people, would, if we had to get scientific, would say like crime is probably predicated upon your circumstance, right? I mean, yeah, I, I would say for the your most geopol- part. Your geopolitical, your, or your... Uh, socioeconomic placement in the society is going to determine how likely you are to be. That's probably, yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, <laughs> do I need to sell drugs or not? Like mm. probably to, you know, um, anyways. Yeah. Is so it illegal for me to say on this podcast that I've sold drugs in the past? I don't think anybody's going to come out. I've sold drugs. <laughs> yeah. I, that's how I first funded my music career basically. Yeah. So I mean, that's a pretty weed. common it wasn't, story. I, drugs is a bad way to say it. I sold weed. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Which I'm in Colorado. It's fine. <laughs> I wasn't living in Colorado at the time. <laughs> I'm not going to say where I was living. Therefore it can't be illegal because they don't know whether or not it was based on the, it was totally illegal at the time. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> <laughs> it could have been legal. I mean, depending on where I was living, right? I mean, Wait, there's is a it, lot of guys. Is that... it legal to sell weed anywhere in the world as like not a dispensary? No, I don't think so. Maybe in like Lisbon, Portugal or some shit. Right. Because uh, didn't they decriminalize every drug? I believe so. I believe you're right. I think that's the thing that I heard because some of my friends went to Boom and they were like, man, you won't believe this you shit. You can just boof it wherever <laughs> you want. <laughs> oh, dude, boofing shit sounds so bad. Apparently, it's real effective. Yeah. <laughs> for those who... Uh, we're taking a left turn here. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, for those who, who haven't heard of the term boofing before, it's where you get, what, like an oral syringe, you mix your drugs into, like, water, put it in the syringe, and then syringe the water up your ass. Up your rectum, yeah. And apparently, it absorbs real fast. Yeah. <laughs> and apparently, in Canada, that's called hooping. Hooping. Yeah. Which in, is funny, because then we talk about how many are is, is hooping allowed at this festival in america in australia it's called shafting <laughs> <laughs> or i think maybe shelving as well shelfing. they also call it shelf great yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah anyway <laughs> back to business <laughs> so <laughs> um i'm interested in like closies come up like that was kind of a big crazy thing that happened and you were involved with that um, yeah what was that like she's um I just say she's a, she is a special person. She has a really, uh, really nice way about her. Um, I think that, you know, she came in at a really cool time and, you know, when people have success in the music industry, it's, it's really like all things working at once, you know, Cole and I worked really hard for her. Uh, you know, she had done some, um, some good songs with Gravitas and, um, uh, she did a couple songs with Otadayo of mm-hmm. uh, the label in France. And, um, you know, those, those did really well. Uh, we landed some tracks with Mr. Suicide Sheep and, um, Ex Quito YouTube label. Uh, and, you know, she did some really smart SoundCloud, uh, some mixes and, you know, I think she just worked really hard. She worked really hard and she had, you know, there was a lot of really good, you know, timing and pacing. Um, you know, we, I think we worked really hard to kind of build the brand and make sure that, um, we didn't try to grow too fast and be patient and be disciplined. And even when there were potentially really exciting things kind of be, we were trying to be smart about when to do that and take things as they come. Do you think at a point, like when you get to say Closey's level, if she just like stopped right now and didn't do shit for like five years, six years, and then just came back and like dropped another EP, do you think it would be as successful? Or do you think people's attention spans would like drop off? No, no, I don't think it would be. I mean, I think she, you know, I think she writes music that, that really, you know, tickles people's brain and, and they're, they're songs that people can go back to. I think that's one thing that, that, you know, I'm more, I'm more curious, like just, um, from the perspective of like any artist, not necessarily her, right. but it's like, let's say once you reach that level, like any artist who reaches that level, like where you kind of hit the critical mass, like 
the way you're getting millions of players on the time. No, I don't. I hold. think you really have to work hard. I think it. Maybe, you think like you can't take a break at I that. I don't think so. That's I think fucked. yeah, it that is, is kind of fucked. I mean, it de- it just depends on where where your priorities are and your goals. Like if yeah. you're trying to get bigger and stay on the circuit. Yeah. And you're. So you think like Flume, if he took like a three four year break, he kind of did. It took a little bit of a break, and he seems still huge, right? That's true. That's true. I mean, I don't know. See, like I'm, and not. Uh, yeah, I, I never want to get to like that level, I think, where I have to work all the time, where yeah. I can't take breaks and shit. Also, I don't think I could get to that level anyway, but like... <laughs> well, I, I just think with that, the question is, what is your definition of success? It, and yeah. what is your And what is your idea for what makes you happy? Yeah, totally, yeah. I think yeah. that's like... I think about that all the time. I think like... Because I watch like a shitload of philosophy videos yeah. uh, on YouTube. Um, so I'm kind of somewhat a philosopher now. <laughs> just a YouTube <laughs> well, philosopher. Well, to go back to Chloe, is like... Sh- there was a time where it's like she was she was it was really hard for her to be on the road as much as she was Mm -hmm. and she was coming back being burnt out and being really tired and struggling with the mental health aspect and also the physical health of like being on the road and touring and playing three four shows in a row or sometimes playing you know a show and then an after party and then waking up in the morning getting on a plane going somewhere else checking in your hotel doing sound check and it's like it is exhausting so there was a guy on one of the videos um of the podcast i was talking to dirt monkey about this yeah and he like time stamped the bit where we were talking about how touring is hard yeah and he was like oh this is like disgusting to listen to because like i go to a factory and work my factory job and then when i get home i don't have the energy to write music and you guys are complaining about flying somewhere to play music it's like dude it's pretty fucking hot on your body i just say do it if you can do it man i mean (laughs) it's not easy it's not it's it's fun the, the 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 being up on stage and playing is the reward right but that's like one everything of your day. yeah <laughs> everything all the rest of the 23 hours involved you're not at home you don't have your bed you don't get to be with your significant other you, you're challenged by the uh, access to good quality food your schedule is a wreck your sleep is a wreck it adds up and humans need a, you know a certain amount of sleep, a certain amount of good quality food or things start to go off the rails. So I, psh, I don't think people, boo. yeah, I, I, I don't <laughs> think on you, dude. <laughs> yeah. I don't think people who don't travel through time zones constantly yeah. and like have this experience really understand it. Or like really not even re- like sometimes you can be, I haven't done that much traveling, but I've, you know, I've been out on the road with beats or, or closey in the past and like not even for that long and be like, wait, are we in San Francisco? Or, you know, it's like, you, you can lose track. Absolutely. Especially when you're going through time zones, like Australia to here, to Taiwan, yeah, to that's India, crazy. to UK, to Israel. Like it's kind of insane because you start, uh, your body eventually is just like, I don't know what fucking time it is, but the sun's up. <laughs> yeah. And then you, you just constantly feel like mega out of it. Yeah. So I guess Closey um, would, would be dealing with that too. Cause she's flying. Yeah. France there would be times time. where I'm she I'm surprised would... she hasn't moved here to be honest. Yeah, there would be times when she would fly from France and we would try to say like, look, you need a couple days in the States before you can really work because it just takes time. And that's not even that big of a time zone jump, you know, it's like eight hours or something. Yeah. If you're going to to Asia or Australia, I mean, that's you're on the other side of the world. Your brain is totally (laughs) crazy. So, yeah, it's a real thing. Um, I mean, just to, you know, you had you hit on a couple of stuff. I I think it's. I think the world is moving faster than it ever has because we have so much access to so much information through mm-hmm. our phones and it just, it goes really quick. And I think for any artist, you know, just using her as an example, but you only kind of get one moment where you're on that first time, you know, big rise. And I think you have to make the most of it and, and go, go for it as much as you can to, to try and, gain as many fans as you can. And then I think if you're at a certain point, then you can back off. I mean, look at what just tool did tool just took 13 years off and they've come back and just smashed it with, you know, all sellout shows and the number one albums. And I I think they're like just so big and have such a cult following. Yeah. Um, so I guess that, that could bring us to another point of rebranding as an artist. Like, so I've thought about this a ton. I've been like, ah, I fucked my career because like, um, I don't think my career is bad. It's fine. But like, I'm like, oh, I could never like hit that like point 
where uh, like, you know, someone like G Jones or Closey or, or somebody like that. And sometimes my mind tries to like blame it on the fact that I've like overshared um, because I think music in some way is like a magic trick. And as soon as you show someone how the magic trick's done, it's no longer a magic trick. You know, it's oh. just like, oh, that's, he was just in the fucking box the whole time. And I think like partially because I've done that a lot, initially I thought it would have the opposite effect where like, and it does have the opposite effect for some people where they watch like my tutorials and my streams and stuff. And then they listen to my music and then they appreciate it more because they know how exactly how right. much work goes into it and how it was done they're like oh wow that's like even better now that i know that but i think for a lot of people it like destroys the magic a little bit and i also think it's like kind of challenging music and i also think i put out like way too many different styles of music so it's really hard for people to know what to expect when they come to a mr bill show or want to go listen to a new mr bill release yeah you know, i'll do like a i mean i think it's all of that at the same time i mean you have carved out a, a place at least to me, a place in our musical history. And, the, and this is a time that we're going to look back on kind of like we look back on the sixties, like in the sixties, there was, you know, civil rights, women's Liberty, uh, you know, the, the rock and roll generation. And now we're living through, or just got kind of coming out of, and Donald Trump is our fucking Richard, Richard Nixon. We had Obama, gay rights and electronic music. And that was like a, what I would call a watershed moment where there was this like huge cultural shift. And we're kind of seeing the pendulum swing back to this alt right and people and, and, but progress was made. And, and it's going to continue to like, it won't ever slide back that far in my opinion. Right. So to answer your question is like, you have carved out your, your a very, very, very cool, important p moment for yourself. So will you ever be headlining Coachella? Probably not. I don't think you make that kind of music. You just, you don't write those kinds of songs and that's okay well that's the thing i've yeah. thought about like rebranding and being like all right i'll just do like extra genre and like just very specifically yeah, like fit into this thing. doing that yeah and then i think <laughs> about it and i'm like i'm like what would happen if i did that all that would happen is i'd want to talk about it and yeah. i'd want to fucking make a bunch of weird shit and I mean, you could maybe do it as a as a a thing i've got a friend i can't say who this is but he he is part of a very very well-known um, electronic music act. Oh, is this the, the, um, I uh, can't say who they are, Okay, but, but he has started a side project to get back to what he found is his original roots in electronic music. And yeah. that is giving him a lot of freedom and, and fun and pleasure. And he knows what it looks like to brand a project and work a project and have it. And so that, that project still, nobody knows who's doing it and people are speculating. He is kind of using the shadow and the magic trick effect to his advantage in that regard. So I do agree with that. I do think that that sometimes the social media of like, I got to share every day. I need an Instagram post a day. <laughs> poop again like i don't want to work for spotify i don't want to work for itunes yeah, i want to work i want the artists to benefit so that whole social media thing it's almost like you're working for instagram or you're working yeah, for yeah. facebook fuck that because yeah you're literally creating content for their platform for them yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it's crazy so you know i sometimes i do artist coaching and and somebody was asking me this question like i was like man you're in control of this you don't have to worry about the numbers like go and make really great music and mm -hmm. and scratch that itch and let that develop and as you have a story to tell then utilize social media to tell that story and you can do live streaming you can do youtube tutorials or behind the scenes things but use it to you how you want it to present the story and it doesn't have to be every day and there are no rules to this shit we have a whole new world available to us in that regard yeah, I think in some ways as well, like another anxiety a lot of artists have, including myself, is that shit is just so oversaturated at yep. this point. It's like like every combination of music at this point has almost been written and like every sound has been combined with every other sound and yeah. every melody. Like, I mean, we don't use many notes in the Western scale, uh, right. Western music, we use 12. Yeah. And of those 12, we really only use seven at a time. Yeah. And then of those seven, we probably don't use all seven in a track anyway. It's true. Um, so it's like every, almost every like melodic combination and harmonic combination have all been kind of put together. So at some points, like I often look at this and I'm like, fucking what's even the point? Like everything's, so oversaturated on social media all the music's been made why why do i even make music anymore huh 
Well, that's sad. That makes me sad. <laughs> well, I mean, then I just start like making fucking serum sounds and shit. And I'm yeah, like, oh, this is fine, I guess. Huh. So a lot of the time, I don't actually like spend my time in here making music. Now I just a lot of the time I'm just making sounds and shit. Sound design work. Yeah, or just fucking around on the modular or something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm 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 excited to see the modulars have made such a comeback because I think that is the antithesis to spending all day in the DAW, and you're getting. There's just, you know, obviously, you know, you do it. And it's like, that's sort of like just getting real with your music or, you know, that whole process and getting physical and, and, uh, just exploring the sound design a whole nother way. That to me is, is, is brilliant, yeah. you know, and it's, that's how it started. And it's funny how things like that come full circle. So, yeah, I mean, it, when you say that it is true, but at the same time, it's like, you are the expression of that. So yeah. it's it, your, your music is the expression of who you are. And so nobody could For ever sure. make your songs the way you do. And yeah, that's also true. And also that, that is true. I do have other, other days where I'm like, I specifically only want to listen to like square pusher or something like that. There's nothing else that will scratch that itch for me right now. Yeah. So in that sense, like, I guess there's certain like, and you are that artist for a lot of people. And I know that yeah. I know sometimes you don't think it, but I mean, you've had, I a never massive, think that actually you've had a massive for sure, man. I mean, you had a massive effect on people. And I think what you've been able to do for the community with your tutorials and with your education and just being who you, being who you are fully with the music you release, I think that's such a great precedent because it allows other people to do that. Mm. And it's not yeah. about being the top or being at the thing. Like, um, I mean, really, it's just um, uh, Ari Hurston has this book. It's called How to Make It in the New Music Industry. Highly recommend it. Great guy. He's he's a rock guy. But this book, if you're trying to figure out how to make it in the industry, I would highly recommend this book. It's uh, He just released his second edition. And he really reframes the question about, like, do you want to be a superstar? Like, we see a lot of people that are superstars and they are not happy because of all the pressure that we just took to, talked about. If you're able to work in the music industry and make a decent living and have some fun and collaborate with people and do cool projects, when you look back on your life, you won't be sad about that. Right. And totally. that's kind of the end to me. Flipping back to like when I was talking about how I watch a bunch of philosophy shit on YouTube, that's one of the things that resonated with me a lot is a video that was just called, I think the video was just called What Constitutes a Good Life. Yeah. And they were talking about it and they were like, does it, is it a good life if everyone around you thought it was a good life or is it a good life if you thought you had a good life? Or like, I mean, yeah. there's so many like, there's no, no real answer to the question. I, I like Gary Vee. I mean, some of the stuff he says is kind of, it gets really repetitive and redundant, but he's like, quit worrying about what anybody else else thinks and just worry about how you feel but about is that you. is that selfish and obnoxious to just think that way well he will also say deliver value to the world do something that that benefits people mm -hmm. and that you know if you're going to work with someone <clears throat> or or do anything with someone like go above and beyond, like really deliver a great piece of work, whatever that is. So that would be, and, and through that you will have your satisfaction as well. So I hear you, but at the same time, it's like you can have both. So I don't yeah. think it's selfish. I think if you're happy and you're fulfilled and you're doing what you love, there's a lot of positive things that are happening in the world because of that. So, I mean, like that happened for me when I discovered, so I started DJing in 1998. I was all in the progressive house, um, sort of uh, progressive trance scene. I, as dubstep hit in 2006, and I went to Burning Man in 2007, really discovered bass music. 2011, I started Gravitas and I really found myself. I found that I'm a facilitator and I like to help people. I really love to help mus musicians, artists get their music out in the world. And I just, I love it. And I found that that was like my thing. And I finally like, you know, I did not like to try to, to push my DJ act like it just never felt right for me and i'm sure other i don't think it feels right for anyone yeah it's them. hard it's i mean hard. some people are like yeah look at me i'm the coolest and yeah you should fucking join my crew and listen to this yeah <laughs> I, I generally i don't know a lot of people like that though most people find the social media game and the constant instagram story updating thing to be like annoying but they yeah. do it because they think they have to yeah I like agree. i have so many friends who are like oh yeah i'm doing this sorry man and i'm doing this in your studio but like i have to because of you know people need to know i'm writing music right right or my fans will just think i'm fucking off and not <laughs> and it's like who gives a shit what your fans think man yeah i mean just put music out that'll prove it right like, right <laughs> yes well and i think there's a certain i think there's a certain um 
there's like a timeline to all of this, right? There's different stages of where you are in your artist career and how, how are you trying to interact with your fans? If it's natural and you're a social person and you like to do that, then do it. And if you're not, then I would pick your punches and make them count. Yeah. Know? I've always liked to do it through like actual content though. Like I've, I've never really, I've done the Instagram story update thing a few days where I've just been like, Hey, I'm just going to Instagram story my whole day. Yeah. And fans seem to like it. Like they're like, Hey man, that's you. You're making funny jokes and shit. That's cool. Yeah. But at, I prefer to, the way I prefer to interact with my fans is by like making a tutorial or putting a song out or something like that. And then being like, Hey, here's a fucking thing I made. What do you, what do you think? Yeah. Um, or not even really asking them what they think. I guess there's just like, they'll leave comments. I mean, the thing I see about you, which I think some people really struggle with is what I would call doing the hard work, like Mm. creating a tutorial, coming up with a concept, filming it, editing it, and then launching it is a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. And you really got to be able to like start and then finish something. Um, Some people are not super trained or haven't done a lot of that in their life. And that can be, so for them, it's easier for them to post a Snapchat or post an Instagram of them in the studio than actually doing the writing. Right. And it's, 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 it's bad because it keeps them from digging in and really doing that. But does it? Because like, there's a lot of people on social media who will like post an Instagram story and they'll just like be active enough on social media that they can almost make that work for their career without doing any of the writing and stuff. I think eventually it doesn't work. Right. Yeah. They're at a certain level. Maybe you can hype yourself up, but eventually like the, I won't say like the best stuff, but like quality will kind of rise up and and it is still somewhat democratic. Yeah. To some degree. I I also think that, um, that quality of music, has almost nothing to do with how big music gets. There's a lot of shit that sucks. That is huge. Yeah, yeah I agree. And there's a lot of stuff that's amazing. That is not huge. True. <laughs> true. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's everything in between. I mean, it, but it's... then also there becomes the question of like, maybe I'm like not a good arbitrator then like maybe the, the people like the millions of people who like this crap thing that's massive are actually right. Maybe I'm wrong, you know? Well, there is, there is no right or wrong in that case. It's just like, I guess, I don't know, like uh, frozen two or I mean, whatever, like, I mean, is that, is that like the most groundbreaking piece of cinema, cinema, (laughs) cinema ever? Like, no, for sure. Not (laughs) it, it feels good. It's like a warm hug, you know? And then like people like that. So there, there is, there is that. And then they have someone like Disney behind it. So, um, there's also marketing though. I, yeah. Like people like stuff that feels familiar. And if you just show it to them enough times, yep. then they'll just like it. Like, you yep. know, you, you get in your car, you hear it, you go to the mall, you hear it, yep. you go to a theater. You I mean, hear I kind of think about that, like Coca-Cola, right? It's yeah, just it's like, like everywhere. If you just see it enough everywhere, it feels familiar and you feel comfortable with it. And therefore yeah. you're like, Oh yeah, no, I like yeah, that. And that's <laughs> what brand marketing is about. It's like, why does Coca-Cola or Pepsi still advertise is because when you go, they're counting on that the next time someone goes into a store and is presented with this, insane amount of options what you just said it feels familiar oh i just got reminded about coca-cola so i better have (laughs) yeah because you like that one feels like the most comfortable and like yeah it's old faithful yeah (laughs) yeah uh there's a good book around this idea it was a 22 immutable laws of of uh marketing do you read a lot of books i do i try Uh, how often do you how, how many hours a day do you think you read uh I have, I have a goal for myself to at least read 30 minutes a day. That's pretty good. Um, yep. I've never read a book in my life. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. <laughs> is there, a re- is there a reason you have like a learning? I have comprehension issues with reading. I, okay. Audio books are fine. Yeah. Um, and YouTube videos at two times speed. Fine. Sure. Like every time I, I ingest an audio so is book. It or, your, is it your eyes or is it? It's, I don't know. It's like, um, I mean, I can read the words on the page. Yeah. But my issue is like, I'll read the same sentence like 15 times before it'll make sense. Ah. Yeah. It's weird. I just can't take information in that way. Yeah. I find it to be in a world where we're all on our phones and we're bombarded by all this it's stuff. Nice it get really gets me to, to kind of calm down, slow down focus on one idea and really process that and digest it. Mm-hmm. I like audiobooks. Like I'll, you know, on a Saturday or Sunday, I'll work out in the garden and, and listen to that. Or if I'm, you know, like do, do something around the house. 
That's really, that's really nice. Yeah. Um, I do have an app, which is kind of like a hack. Um, uh, cause I'll, I like, I like, books about marketing or books about, um, like right now the book I'm reading is by a guy named Ryan holiday. It's called ego is the enemy. Mm -hmm. And he just wrote another book that called, uh, stillness is the key. And, and he, you know, he's on like Aubrey Marcus's podcast and Tim Ferriss's podcast. I I listened to an Aubrey Marcus podcast like two days ago. Yeah. Some guy about, uh, fuck, what was his thing? He was basically talking about how, how he likes to embrace fear and put himself in uncomfortable situations because that trains him to like, I don't know, be more calm or something. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of the stoic philosophy. If you will put yourself in a challenging position, then, then when shit really gets real, you're, you're steeled, you've steeled yourself. Right. right? And I I was saying some interesting shit too. He was like, you know, you can put yourself in some uncomfortable situation, like, um, uh, like doing some insane workout where you just like do 15 minutes of straight high intensity work or eight minutes or however long it was to the point where you're fucking dying. Yeah. Like it would kill most people to do. Right. But like, you know some people in the gym there will be like fucking yeah i'll do that shit but then when you say like all right now challenge yourself in a different way let's like freely dance around they'll be like fuck that you know yeah yeah no i agree it's like yeah interesting so i mean le- some people like are- leaning into your 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 getting outside your comfort zone is definitely something is like great way to grow if you're been, afraid of something go yeah, try it i've been trying to do that a lot yeah. actually yeah yeah yeah. So going back to the books, uh, I, I got this app. It's kind of expensive, but it's called Blinkist. Blinkist. I be B L I N K S T, and they basically synthesize the best parts. It's like you know cliff notes for a book. And so within about fifteen or twenty minutes, you can listen to or read the whole synopsis of the book. Hmm. And that, what I'm using that for is like, I can get that de- basically that download of that idea. And if yeah. I really want to dig into it more, I'll go read that book. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, what blinks blinks and yeah. it's an app. Yep. And people just at the, at the place, like people who work at blinks yep. read the book and then just go. Yeah. They well basically do a book report that's fucking and then, sweet. and so they write it and then somebody will also read it. So you can either listen to it or you can read it. And, and it'll they give like you the, uh, the best parts because sometimes you read a book or like I do, and I'll be like, "Dude, you could have said this in like two pages." Oh, totally. And yeah. do they give the, <laughs> do they give it to you in like an objective way, or do they give it to you in like some way where they're like, "Oh, this Tim Ferriss book is basically about reselling white goods on Amazon and like uh, automating your day <laughs> job." So yeah, you can it's fucking pretty, take it's ice pretty objective. It's pretty. It's pretty cut and dry. There's no. It's not like they're trying to sell it to you. They don't make any. Uh, they well, they might. They might have like an affiliate thing, but they're they're really just trying to to allow people to digest more or kind of see what's out there, you know, and cause sometimes I'll read half a book and I'm, and then I'm just like, this is crap. I don't actually want to read this. And I do that all the time. Put it away. <laughs> I, I do that with audiobooks a lot. So it's I, hard though. Cause you feel like you've already invested this time, right? Uh, or not you. <laughs> no, I do. I, I'm pretty good at just being like, fuck it. Like that. <laughs> but, I mean, here's the thing is I think I'm practiced at doing that because I do that with tunes all the time. That's right. And there's a thing with, that happens with tunes a lot where you just sort of like grow apart from it or you just like fucking yeah. whatever. It's not a good idea. So you don't struggle with attachment. I think a lot not of producers much. struggle with attachment. I think you've done, you've made so many songs and you can work so quick that you know mm. you can bang out another yeah, one. Yeah, I'm like, I'll make another one. Yeah. <laughs> so some people are like, oh, you know, I spent this week on this one bit. Mm. It's really hard to move on to the next But it's thing. a double-edged sword because then I don't specifically appreciate anything I do that much either. Huh. So it's like everything to me is just whatever. Like it's, you know, I, <laughs> whereas I I think a lot of artists, they, yeah. you know, they, they get that attachment, but then they also get this like confidence of like, man, this fucking tune is so sick. And then they shop it real hard. And, right. Right. You know, I Interesting. never do that. Cause I'm just like, fuck it. It's, yeah. It's another tune. Who cares? Yeah. Huh. <laughs> so I think there's like a duality there of you know, good and bad from having that mindset. Yeah. I mean, that, that is definitely an interesting point of like the, uh, being attached to something is that, cause I think most attachment, you get attached to the outcome of a, of something and then you feel a lot of sadness or stress or frustration because things are not going the way you had envisioned in your mind. Mm. But if you can just sort of kind of realign and be present to the moment and see things for the way they are or, you know, be more objective to the now, you can let go of that attachment and just move, just kind of go with the flow and see where the opportunity is now for whatever it is. Yeah. Well, I mean, the way I kind of look at it, and this is like kind of contentious and EPROM thinks I'm an idiot for thinking this. Um, at least he, so I mentioned to him on Twitter that I don't believe in free will. Yeah. And he was like, I can't believe you think that. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, so I, 
um, a lot of people say like, oh, you know, I'm just like the vessel and the music just goes through me. I don't necessarily think about it that way, but I think that I don't really have much choice in it. So I'm just like, I'll sit here and it will just happen. But I mean, all the choices have already, I think, been made or huh. like at least if they haven't, we don't even know where like thoughts occur and all that shit. Sure. I don't think that I make them necessarily. So I don't, I, I just am not a believer in free will very much. Okay. So in that sense, um, I don't get attached uh, that much anyway, because I'm like, whatever, it's going to be how it is. So fuck it. Very zen. I mean, I, I can see that. I, you know, I don't know where I stand on free will. I, I feel like I have free will, but at the same time, I can definitely recognize where, you know, if you're talking about the multiverse where there's infinite possibilities and it's already already You don't happened. even have to go that ethereal yeah. to, to think about it. Um, so where do you get stuck on? Why, why do you think you have free will? I guess in my mind, I experience the process of choice. And the deliberation between I could take this path or I could take this other path. Yeah. Um, I don't know. So there's been some like fMRI tests uh -huh. uh, to where if you give somebody a choice with like two things, um, the one that they actually end up picking, they pick like 10 seconds in their mind earlier than they actually object, like pick it objectively. So it's like any deliberation that's happening is like the choice gets made way before you're conscious of it. Okay. That doesn't necessarily mean we don't. So the your def, the, I guess we'd have to define free will would be the the cerebral consciousness of the words in your head, almost languagely uh, processing. I would like to have chocolate ice cream versus the visual or uh, more instinctual. I want a chocolate ice cream, like the, <laughs> the lizard brain saying that, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, so for instance, this is an example that Sam Harris gives. Like, what's your favorite city? Uh, but right now, Denver. <laughs> Denver. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, what made you? Did you when you were making that choice in your head? Uh, did did the option Cairo, Egypt, come into mind? No. So you were not free to pick that, right? I mean, no. I guess not. Have you been to like uh, I don't know? Have you been to like Lyons, France? No. So you were not free to pick that either, really. <laughs> so it's like uh, that doesn't just prove your free will. It just means that just that's means based you, on my experience. I haven't been there. It I just mean, means I, that your your ability to actually choose between things is like way more limited than you might feel. Okay. Like, you know, I have a limited subset of choices based on my world experience. So. Yeah, and I think that that subset is actually really small. And I, if you like really think about it, like all okay. the choices that you have. I, I mean, you pointed that out that maybe we only use what five notes out of the 12 note scale in a song and so on. Yeah, so exactly. And it's very only, limited, but that's still, you still are making the decision. Hey, I want to, I want to go in this direction. You can make mm -hmm. a down tempo tune or you can make a banger. Like right. you feel like you're not cho choosing that. You're just kind of letting it unfold or. Um, n well, I mean, I will make the decision, like I'll make a banger or I'll make a down tempo tune, but. Yeah. Um, the choice to do that in the first place is like, I think already made based on just like the shit that's happened in the last few days, a lot of which I had no control over. Right. You know? Like, let's say I went to a show and, uh, the DJ that was playing there played a really sick oh, for sure. And I was like, well, I didn't choose that. He chose that. Yeah. Like, I when no I read control. a book, all of a sudden I start to see the world through that lens yeah. or I listen or I see a good movie and then all of a sudden everything starts yeah, to show Yeah, exactly. Up. And then it's yeah. like, so to what degree, like, did you even have the choice to, to buy that book too? Because then it's like, it was shown up in your, well, it's like, a, it's like the butterfly effect. It's kind of like this cascading stream of things affecting things, but I, right. but, I but mean, it seems like that's going to happen anyway. It seems yeah. like shit's just going to affect shit how it's going to. So it's not worth getting too stuck up or hung up on why. And yeah, I like the end know. result of your, of your philosophy. Yeah, yeah. You can let go of things and, and move to the next, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or, you know, some people get really stuck on that idea of that. They wanted something to go that way. Mm -hmm. And that can be really challenging for them and frustrating for everyone around them. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Makes yeah. sense. Well, that's probably a good place to end this yeah, podcast. Yeah, man. This was so, great. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so, I love your studio. Thanks. It's good to connect. I love being in Denver. We did uh, last night with Schwangel and the Desert Dwellers open for him. And we had uh, Goop Stepper and uh, Supercilious all played. And like I said, Denver's popping off. Well, you guys have got an amazing music scene here. I'm super jealous. Austin yeah, it's is definitely awesome. not. I'm about to leave. So. Yeah. So. Well, San Francisco is awesome, too. It's pretty sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, dude, tour, tour de uh, America for Bill. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> awesome, man. All right, man. Cheers. Well, thanks for having me. Appreciate nice. it. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast.
Podcast.